Hello, and welcome to another Primary Source Close Read. My name is Josh, and I'm excited today to be joined by Dr. Josh Dunn as we take a look at the court case of West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett. How are you, Josh? Doing great. Great to be with you. Thank you. So today, this case is uh, involves the First Amendment to the Constitution. Um, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. So to start us off, Josh, could you give us some background on the First Amendment, specifically the free speech and freedom of religion clauses? Certainly. So it, in the First Amendment, you start off with the religion clauses and you have the establishment clause and then you have the free exercise clause. Uh, and there's some debate about what they uh, initially meant. Uh, the establishment clause that was pretty clear, it meant that there was going to be uh, no national church, uh, but then the free exercise clause also, it was pretty apparent, meant that there, there were some forms of religious exercise that, that were going to be protected. And you could also see a position of neutrality in I think both clauses. Uh, freedom of speech uh, and then several other rights following freedom of speech is in the second half of the first amendment. And I think for the founders, they regarded free speech as essential to self-government. And again, you can see that in the logic of the, those rights themselves. You have speech. And if you want to speak out about something and, and you're concerned about what government is doing, then you're going to want to use the press, the technology to reach more people. Then you're going to want other people to join with you, assemble, and then you're going to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So for the founders, speech was essential uh, to, to, to self-government. And they also thought that you had a kind of property in your opinions as well. Uh, and so this is grounded in, in, in your nature as, as a person. And it would be, in many circumstances, uh, improper for government and to intrude into that. Great. Now, this specific case is going to involve public schools and questions around freedom of speech um, and freedom of religion. Now, there had been a prior case, actually, just a few years before this case, Minersville School District v. Gobitis. Could you tell us about that? And that's going to help set the foundation of uh, West Virginia v. Barnett. Yeah, so that case was decided just three years before West Virginia uh, versus, versus Barnett. And the issue was really the same. Uh, it was a flag salute case. And Jehovah's Witnesses in that case protested, argued that it violated uh, their uh, religious doctrines and beliefs to have to to have to essentially give a symbol uh, uh, in response to, to another government symbol. Um, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court upheld the, the Pennsylvania law, which allowed it. Uh, and the majority opinion was written by Just, Justice Felix Frankfurter. And he made many arguments, uh, including that the Supreme Court has no particular competence to make judgments about these, these kinds of things. Uh, they would also mean that the Supreme Court would be a national school board uh, and so on. And that also that uh, inculcating patriotism would be a legitimate function of government. Uh, and all of those issues then uh, rose again uh, in West Virginia versus Barnett. Okay, so our constitutional question then for this case is, does a compulsory flag salute for public school children violate the First Amendment? So we talked about the First Amendment. Here it is, the, the text. Um, so what uh, the parents who brought this lawsuit, I know we've talked about both freedom of speech and freedom of religion. What arguments did they make when they initially brought their lawsuit? All right, so they, they argued again that this violated their freedom of religion, uh, but then also they made free, free speech claims. And eventually the case was decided primarily on free speech grounds. It wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, officially you would say it wasn't a religion case in the end, even though that was the motivation, the motivation for the parents because they regarded it as an intrusion into their, uh, into their religious doctrine and, and, and therefore their, their religi religious freedom. But when you finally get to the Supreme Court decision, as we'll see, really they grounded their decision on free speech claims. Great. Yeah, so really this case is kind of a duplicate of Minersville then. Would you say it's essentially the same? Right, it's essentially the same issue. Yeah, yeah, great. So let's take a look then at the opinion. Um, the, the majority uh, ruled in favor of Barnett by a, 
a significant margin. I think right, right. was it unanimous in Gobitis, I believe. Um, it, it was a significant margin in Gobitis ruling the opposite way. Right, so the right, court right. essentially reversed, uh, a large majority of them reversed, which is really interesting. And we can get into the reasons why they did that. But let's take a look at yep. this, um, the majority opinion here. What stands out to you here um, in this, this writing here? All right, so obviously in, 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 in this quotation from the decision written by Justice Jackson, Justice Jackson, by the way, was known as one of the greatest writers to ever sit on the Supreme Court. And there are many memorable turns of phrase uh, that he has in, in this opinion that are, are still quoted quite, quite often today. Uh, but here he's simply saying that, look, the, the, the Bill of Rights means that some things are not up for debate. Uh, and so uh, regardless of whether or not you think it would actually be a good idea for West Virginia to be able to impose this policy upon all the school children of, of West Virginia, that doesn't mean that they're allowed to. Uh, so as you can see from the very first uh, clause there, it's to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy. So uh, regardless, again, of what your position on this, uh, on this is or how salutary you think the policy might be, uh, that doesn't mean that you can, that you can therefore do it. Um, that again, the constitution sets boundaries on what the government is allowed to do. Right, yep, exactly. Um, and you talk about how Justice Jackson is a great writer. This is one of the most famous um, sentences from this case and really one of the most famous sentences ever on, on the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment specifically, I would say. Um, and any further input on this specific paragraph? Yes, so this is the most famous passage from, from the entire decision. This is the one that's quoted most often. Uh, and here you see, um, there are really two issues that they had to confront in this case, constitutional questions that they had to confront, which is one is, is symbolic speech speech? That is, even if you aren't using words, does that count as speech and therefore could fall underneath for First Amendment protection? Uh, and the Supreme Court said yes. Now, the, there are debates to this day about how much um, conduct has to be imbued with communicative content in order to count as speech. But the court was clearly saying symbolic speech is speech, right? So it's, it's speech. Then the question is, can the government force you to say something? Can it force you to com uh, compel you to say, to say something that you do not agree with? So that was the second issue, compelled speech. So first issue is symbolic speech. Second issue is, is can the government compelled speech or compelled speech? And here, what is he saying? The government cannot compel you to, to, to profess your belief in something that you don't actually believe in. This is beyond the bounds of, uh, of, uh, of government power. Uh, so this is a very clear standard. If you see the government telling you that you have to confess something, that you have to state your agreement with it, uh, you almost certainly... Uh, can see the government risking a First Amendment challenge. Great. Yeah. Um, now, what's really interesting about this case is that, like we said a couple of years earlier, um, the court ruled the opposite way. And I think context is probably important in that, in that um, that was at the start of World War II when Gobitis was decided, I believe, 1941, 1940, around there. And so you could argue that there was this sense of like, we need to instill patriotism in our students. And so therefore there's, the government has a compelling reason to require um, students to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Now though, really only two years later, I think they're, they're changing their mind. And in this concurring opinion, I believe it's Justice Hugo Black's opinion here. He had originally ruled um, uh, in the opposite way in Ingobitis, and now he's kind of explaining why he switched. What do you what do you see in this passage? Passage? Why why do you think him and some of the other justices changed their mind? Well, I, I don't actually know about his personal thought processes that led him to, to, to change his mind other than what he wrote in the opinion. And I think it's just that he became persuaded by the majority 
uh, opinion by, by Justice Jackson. And there were some justices who changed their votes, but you also had significant changes in the composition of the court. FDR had been able to appoint uh, several more justices to the court who had a different position on this. So it was a combination of new, new justices plus previous justices who, who switched, uh, switched their votes. Um, and so obviously here, uh, what you see the justice saying is that patriotism is not something that the government can uh, instill by force, uh, uh, can't compel people again to be, uh, to be pa uh, patriotic, that instead it has to spring naturally from this. And he, of course, is again addressing his very uh, angry colleague, Justice Frankfurter, who wrote a very lengthy dissent, criticizing the majority for overturning the, 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 his opinion uh, it, in Go, Go Bidus. Uh, but one of the, once again, Frankfurter was reiterating in his dissent in this, in this case that, that trying to instill patriotism is something that's a legitimate function of government. He obviously thought that it's, a, it's something that government uh, can at least encourage. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of Justice Frankfurter, we're going to let him have the last word here. Um, he argued, like you said, for a number of reasons why Go Biden should should continue to be precedent, one of which um, which he talks about here is that he doesn't want the court to get too involved in what he thinks is a policy question. Can you speak further to that? Certainly. So uh, Justice Frankfurter was known as one of the great advocates of judicial restraint in Supreme Court history. And uh, the idea of judicial restraint was created by progressive legal scholars constitutional scholars in the late 1800s or early 1900s, and Justice Frankfurter comes out of that school. Uh, and this dissent in West Virginia ver uh, versus Barnett is known as one of the two classic statements of ju ju judicial restraint by a Supreme Court justice. There are others, uh, but one, one of the two. The other one was also written by Justice Frankfurter himself. Ironically, when the Supreme Court was once again overturning a previous uh, decision that he had written. But what I think is essential uh, for understanding his argument is that he did disagree with the, with the majority on the merits, but there was something deeper uh, for, for, for Justice Frankfurter, which is that he thought that if the court decided more and more questions, they would actually end up uh, limiting the rights that Americans have. So sometimes this is framed as, well, Justice Frankfurter what was unconcerned about the protection of individual rights while the majority was more concerned with it. And that's not quite accurate. Instead, what Frankfurter thought was that the best place for citizens to protect their rights is through the political process. And the more and more decisions that are decided through the court, that, uh, that means that people become less and less engaged in the political process. And some of those political muscles of citizenship, which are necessary for preserving individual liberty, are going to atrophy. Uh, so that's where you could say it's, it, I, I don't think it's really a clash between just protection of ind individual rights versus not protecting individual rights, but what's the best mechanism for doing so. Great. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And that's a perennial question in the United States of who should be the one, um, what's the role of the Supreme Court in protecting our individual rights? Um, what's the role of legislatures in protecting individual rights? So let's return back to our, our original constitutional question. Does a compulsory flag salute for public school children violate the First Amendment? So 20 seconds or 30 seconds, how did the court rule? Um, and does that still stand today? Uh, the court ruled that, yes, it does violate the First Amendment because they said that symbolic speech can still count as speech, even if you're not using words. Uh, and then the second reason it violates the First Amendment is because the government cannot compel you to speak in support of something that you disagree with. So compelled speech by the government is unconstitutional. Great. And any no changes in precedent today? Can a school require a student in a public school to say the Pledge of Allegiance? No, they cannot. And you still see controversies, though, because sometimes you will see cases where there are teachers who have tried to compel students or force them to, uh, to, to uh, say, the, say the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and again, they're risking litigation with that. Uh, but so it could create some some division within within classrooms within schools with uh with, within school districts to this day 
Uh, but most of the time, uh, I think teachers understand that they're not allowed to do this, but they are allowed to, of course, set aside time uh, to, for students to, say, to say, the, say the Pledge of Allegiance. And they can require that students not be disruptive right, while, while others uh, choose to say the Pledge of, Pledge of Allegiance if they, uh, if they decide to do that. Sure. Great. Well, thank you so much, Josh. As always, always very enjoyable to talk with you about this. Uh, the Bill of Rights recently released a homework help video on this exact Supreme Court case. So if your students are looking for a quick four minute uh, refresher on the, the details of this case, be sure to check that out. We'll include a link to it. Now, if you're looking for any other materials, um, e-lessons, uh, podcasts, anything, we have it for you. Be sure to check out our website for that. We release videos every week. Thanks for joining.